I told you before, they call me tomato for some reason. <laughs> I just <laughs> blast really easily. <laughs> and well, thank you for for having me, for, for giving me this chance to to have a conversation with you. Um, we follow you uh, really closely here in, uh, in Hermosillo. And uh, really get it. I'm totally happy to have a, a, a chat with you. So let's see if we can make this happen. Sure. Um, well, first of all, uh, try to uh, congratulate you on, on, your, on your recent project, which is Koriki, if I'm not wrong. Koriki, yep. That's right. If, well, first of all, uh, it's a band, not a project. Uh, uh, sorry <laughs> it's, uh, for saying all that. Right. Yeah. That's, uh, it's funny. People, I think that um, it's a, it's a, people often, those words become interchangeable project and band um in the case of say for instance the evens people kept saying oh it's a project you're doing with your girlfriend which it was not a fucking project i was doing with my girlfriend it was a band it was, so, a band. I was doing with amy farina you know <laughs> but i think there's a and i don't think this is a case with what you were saying but i there's a tendency i think to diminuize things by saying like well it's a, a side project or whatever as opposed to whatever my real band might be but my real band is is Kariki. That's yeah. my real fucking band right now. All right, yeah, Koriki. And um, definitely saying that, uh, well, I use that word to mean a band, actually, sorry. Uh, understood, that's what I said. I said I'm not saying this, is, but I think there's a tendency yeah. in, uh, in, the, in the kind of, within the scene or within the, the parlance, the way people speak, there's kind of, they use, the, they interchange these words and they're very subtle. Yeah. But not, I don't think you're doing that. I'm just, that's why I was like, it's a band. Excellent, um, yeah, and, and an excellent uh, uh, record, by the way. Congratulations! On thank you very that. kindly. And thank just played a, a few songs in uh, in our show. Our show is called Eclecto Maryland yes. at uh, Politica Rock and Roll Radio, which is the the community radio I collaborate here uh, with. And um, well, uh, for starters, what's uh, with the name? What, what is it about? Uh, Ricky, yeah. Uh, Kariki is a, you have, do you know, a game, you know what Liar's Dice is? You know, dice, like they roll dice. Yeah. And there's, and there's a game, there's games called Liar Dice Games. Oh, right. So, so basically it's a, Kariki is a game in which um, you roll dice under, under a cup and you tell the person next to you what it is. And then they have to roll the same number or higher and tell the person next to them but no one can see the dice. Oh, right. I get that. So, so um, we, this is a game that we learned, Fugazi, that is, learned in 1989 or 90 from a British uh, a band of British guys. Um, I think it was Thatcher on Acid was the name of the band. And oh, awesome band. I remember that. Great band, yeah. And so they're a good friend of ours. And we were playing a show with them in, in the Netherlands, in Holland. And... Um, they were, I went backstage and they were sitting around a table playing this game and just really yelling at each other and just laughing. <laughs> and I said, what is this game? So they taught me the game. And then the other members of Fugazi came back and we all started playing it and we became obsessed with it. Then we came back um, to America. We told all of our friends. So Amy, for instance, was part of our scene. She was, you know, so we, everyone played Cricky all the time. Now the it reason- It became a thing. It became a thing, but here's the- Here's the um, the point of it is that you, you know you can imagine they did then you know it goes like you know four five six seven eight nine ten eleven and then double ones double twos double threes double fours double fives double sixes but the number one winning roll period uh -huh. is a two and a one two a and a one. Right, a three. <laughs> so, and that's Kariki. We're a three piece. There you go. So right. you're a right. A so originally, member. originally we were going to call ourselves the Odds, which we thought would be great. But there's already a million bands called the Odds, well, so we didn't we didn't want to use it. So Kariki, it's fine. Brendan, it was Brendan's idea actually. Brendan said you should call yourselves Kariki, and we just thought it was a joke for years, and then we thought, oh shit, let's just do it. <laughs> so yeah. that that uh, is a great. Great, great story for the name of your band, definitely. Uh, well, it's uh, Amy Farina, your wife, and Joe Lally, 
uh, on the bass, right? Correct. Uh, great uh, musicians and uh, uh, on their own with their previous bands as well. We've listened to them. And, uh, and what about the first song that we heard? It was Clean Kill, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, it, it brings to mind when uh, the chorus goes, so wash your hands or it, it's well, not part, enough. At the end, <laughs> at the end in the end, um, there's a refrain that not enough soap and water. Not enough soap and water, that's right. It, right. it, it, it sounds really um, to the point nowadays, I guess, with all this COVID-19 thing. Uh, but it's so. understandable that uh, yeah. it, the topic is different, right? It's uh, yeah, of course, about, yeah. There would uh, be no, there would be no. I mean, first off, I wrote those lyrics four years ago. Um, but I mean, really, it's a, the soup and water. The whole point of is that people who are guilty can't clean themselves. It's like Macbeth, you know, the out down yeah. spot. You can't wash your hands, and the song itself is really. It's about a woman who operates a drone from an office building, right? And so she's done these, she, she leans, leaves her work every day completely clean, but she can't clean off the spot, you know? At all. And I think it's really, I mean, it's really a song about our society, but you know, that because the, the idea of a, a clinical murder is, is just as filthy as anything else. Yeah, definitely. And uh, that brings to mind nowadays topic. Uh, well, uh, what's your take on uh, Juliana Sanchez's uh, case? Juliana Sanchez? Oh, the woman who was killed in the... No, I'm she... sorry. Juliana Sanchez. <laughs> Assange? Juliana, the Assange, WikiLeaks Julian guy? Julian Assange. Yeah. Julian Assange. Oh, sorry. Um, well, you know, I don't know, what is he, where is he now? Is he in London? He's in London. He's been arrested, right? <laughs> yes, that's right, yeah. uh, for quite some Why time. Why is that? What is the connection? I don't quite understand. Uh, because of uh, the WikiLeaks role on displaying, you know, actually this kind of... Uh, oh, I, th I think that I was aware of drone... I wasn't thinking about WikiLeaks. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about just the actuality of it. That's we know right. that drones exist. We know that drones are attacking people, and we know that there are people who are operating the drones are not in the drones. That's right. right? We know that they're in office buildings and, you know, in Arizona, you know, they're like <laughs> somewhere, uh, you know, there's in the middle of some office park. Um, Hence the clean kill, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. So, but no, it's not, it was not related to the WikiLeaks stuff. I, I actually don't, I mean, yeah, I don't draw most of my, I don't, I don't draw my sort of lyrical things from like WikiLeaks. I just, that's just not my world. I don't follow internet stuff really. Mm -hmm. I just live, you know, I just, I just look there you around. Go. <laughs> yeah. And uh, well, uh, now that you have uh, Kariki all uh, set up, I mean, it, it's been set up for quite some time, as you have mentioned. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, you previously played uh, live you know, venues and all that. Uh, what's the scenario right now for? Guess we'll find out. I mean, here's the deal. Music was here first. Music was here before music business. Uh, I think music is a form of communication that predates language. So music will never die. Now the structures in which music is being presented, they may, they may change. They have mm -hmm. changed forever. They always have changed. Um, I mean, think of it like this, that until electricity came around, there really was no way to buy music anyway, right? There was no way you could listen to music without playing it yourself or seeing somebody else play it, right? So for a millennia, for more time than you and I could even imagine, you, know, you could never buy music. It wasn't until, really, until records came along that people could buy music, and then listen to music. Um, so music was valid that entire time. And whatever happens to the structure in which we are accustomed, it doesn't matter because music will figure it out. Now the venue situation, I th you know, it seems possible that a lot of venues are gonna get destroyed by this. 
But, you know, if you think about, for instance, World War II, a lot of venues got destroyed in World War II along with every fucking thing else in Europe, right? Flat, Definitely. right? And I feel like, I feel like that people will figure it out. Now, obviously, it's a mess. And I feel terrible for the people who have suffered, the families who have suffered, whose family members have gotten very sick or who have died. It's a nightmare, you know. Um, I'm, I feel terrible for the political part of this. You know, I think it's, it's so discouraging. Um, I think that something like this has been, um, has really exposed the fragility of the American um, system in terms of healthcare and the way people take care of, right? So, um, but I've always been on the outside. Like I'm a fucking punk. So (laughs) this is not, I'm not surprised by any of it. Um, In terms of what will happen, I don't know. I really don't know. And it's interesting that, you know, we, Amy and Joe and I played together for three and a half or four years before we even did a gig. We practiced three or four days a week. And then we said, I guess we should do a show. So we did a show and then we practiced for another year. And then we did a few more shows and we made a record, you know, and like, or whatever. But, and now like there's no shows, but we're still practicing. We practice yesterday, we practice Wednesday and we practice Monday. We just work on new ideas because it's music. And so when people say to me, well, you haven't, you don't really play music these days. Yeah, I do play music, but I'm not playing it live. So whatever, like, I don't know what will happen. I do think that because we don't play venues, that we play unusual or unorthodox spaces, Mm -hmm. there are chances are that we will find a place to play before the clubs reopen. Definitely. I mean, you you have been doing that for a long time, right? Right. So, but we'll see what happens. But I'm also, I'm not... um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in, like, when I drive on a road, on a street, right, there's a yellow line down the middle of the street. There's nothing that prohibits me from crossing that line at all. There's no wall, nothing. But my brain and my social contract that I don't want to cause injury or hurt anybody else, I stay on that, on the right side of that line. And then when that light turns red, I stop. Even in the middle of the night when there's no cars, I stop. It's a social <laughs> contract. So in the same light, um, when I'm with, with the music, like with the situation with the pandemic, like until people are comfortable gathering in a room together, I'm fine. We can wait. I'm patient. I've always been patient. And always playing. That's right. Always playing. Yeah. Great. And... Uh... Well, on uh, talking about, uh, you know, bands and, and, uh, and records and everything that you just mentioned, uh, it brings to mind, well, your longtime endeavor uh, uh, with Discord. 40 years in, November, in December. That's right. So uh, I bet there, there's been several offers from uh, mainstream record uh, business for Fugazi, you know, for Fugazi. Not, for, not for my label. I mean, we're too mm. weird. <laughs> no. No, but Fugazi, right. for sure. Fugazi had a repeated overtures. Meyer Thread, that was right at the very end of the band, that was in 1983, I think right when we were breaking up, somebody said, oh, I think some label wants to talk to you guys. But it was ridiculous. Like, none of us, that would never made sense. And Fugazi... Um, Obviously, we are selling more records than many major labels bands. I mean, you have to remember that, like when Repeater came out, we sold two hundred fifty thousand copies. Like, boom, you know. Was, so I think that they were, of mm-hmm. course, very interested. The thing is, major labels, what they're interested in is always money. They're a business. I'm not saying that they're evil. They're not even wrong or bad. That's just, but that's what you have to accept. What they are, they're not interested in signing important music. They're not interested in signing visionary music. 
They're not interested in any of that. What they're interested in is music that will sell. Exactly. That's it. That doesn't mean they're doing anything wrong. It's literally what they're constructed to do. But that was not interesting to us. So in the case of Discord, um, I don't know if anybody ever actually, any label actually ever thought like, maybe we should talk to Discord. But I would imagine that I think my reputation precedes me at this point. So I don't think many people would even bother talking. They're like, I mean, occasionally I think people would call because they didn't think it'd be funny. <laughs> That's a prank. And actually, one guy, a very well-known music guy, a very like old um, sort of major guy who started some of the earliest major labels. He he was in town for something he had to do down the, on the hill. And he asked if I would meet with him. And I meet a very, very famous guy and a famous you know guy. So I was like, yeah, I'll come meet you. So we met in the uh, uh, restaurant of this, you know, hotel you're staying in. And uh, we just started talking and we were, he, we were telling stories to each other. We had a great time. And he was telling me about Jimi Hendrix, all the, you know, all this stuff. And then um, at the very end, it was like he had to go to a meeting or something. And he said, I, okay, I just got to give you the pitch. I said, okay, give me the pitch. And then so he made out this pitch for Fugazi. And I said, nah, no, it's not going to, not something we'd be interested in, you know, but thanks, appreciate it. And then he said to me, I got to tell you, I told people I was going to try to speak to you and everybody's going to say, everyone's told me, you're going to talk to Ian. You're going to have a great time talking to him. And then at the end, you'll make a pitch and he's going to turn you down and you're going to feel really good about it. And he goes, and I do. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, you know, it was, I think it's just, a, I think I'm, I'm he just. had to do it. Yeah, and it was good. We, and it, I, was, I loved it. I mean, it was fascinating. Um, but you have to remember, like, is it, like, for instance, we've been doing this label for 40 years. I've never used a single contract with any of the bands. I've never had a band leave in uh, unpleasant terms. I had a few bands go to other labels, but never bad. I still have those records. No one's ever taken the record from me. There's never, I don't have a lawyer. I don't have, I've never, I don't have lawyers. I've never had a lawyer come after me. Um, it's too weird for the majors. They, that's their whole world is lawyers and contracts. And it just wouldn't make any sense, you know? So in those terms, we can say that Discord's a total mystery <laughs> as uh, the way of working and, and, and it's definitely success because it's it has endured right right i mean you could say it's a mystery or you could say it's a mystery that why people behave in other ways because it seems so human and normal like for instance when you arrange this particular this 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 discussion we're having how did that who did you talk to <laughs> who are you communicating? directly directly yes right so was it that it was pretty straightforward right yes definitely i i i had to <laughs> i had to right. try i had to try right but the thing is that's the thing is like, it's like it's what i find is curious is why people do things the other way i imagine you've also tried to interview other bands where you've had to talk to a publicist or a or management people and it's just so frustrating yeah, and it uh, just doesn't connect. And, uh, right. Right. And, and the way you just put that, I think the more complicated things are, the, the more times uh, people don't do things. Right. And when and I you think try things I, simpler, they happen. You know, I come, I'm a punk, you know, I come from a punk tradition. And I grew up here in Washington, D.C., we had no idea how music business works. So we made our own music business and we shaped it after our, our, our own ethics, what we thought would be good. And people said, why did Fugazi have such low door prices? But because we didn't want to pay a lot of money to see shows. It just seemed so obvious, you know, and plus it was funny. We enjoyed, we enjoyed fucking with the system. You yeah, know, it's, big it's, time. <laughs> it's just good. It's a, it's a really, it's engaging and it's challenging and, you know, I, I believe in creative response. So if there's a dilemma that we, you know, how can we, what's a way to, to contend and negotiate this dilemma that would be creative? There must be a way around. Uh -huh. You know, but it's just a different way of thinking. But it's also, you know, it takes a lot of work. 
and also you, you, you risk being poor because it's never been about money. And I think that's where people get, they get up, they get uncomfortable because, you know, they, people have equate, equated success with money. And yeah. I just don't, just not part of my deal. That's the paradigm shift, I guess. Right. But I, that to me, it comes straight out of punk. And that's, it's interesting, like the, the people, a lot of people who I think are maybe take the punk moniker now or, or you, they're inspired by or the people think of them as punks. I'm so struck by their embrace of this stru business structure. They all they have managers and agents and publicists, which none of us would ever have had, ever. <laughs> you know, um, and I'm not, I don't mean to call them their validity or the legitimacy into question. That's not my point. Um, however, um, I find it weird because the whole idea of punk for me was engaging all these people directly so that we all, like the kids, if you weren't in a band, you were putting on a show. And if you weren't putting on a show, you were putting on a fanzine. If you weren't putting on a fanzine, you were making the food. If you were whatever it was, everybody was engaged. And it wasn't a job. You know, it was a tribe. A tribe. That's the key word, I think. Community, right? Right. So, anyway, what's your next question? Oh, well, um, I basically put out what the community here uh, like about the about the whole history that you've been part of and um, being part of uh, all those bands being part of uh, the discord and uh, the whole way of doing things in a in a really simple way it meant a lot for for many things for many people here uh, me being a teenager and listening to uh, minor threat for instance and uh, really fuel me up be first with the sound that was really engaging and then when i found out about the lyrics and i i learned english <laughs> it, it, it made total sense and it made many connections and and from then on well we've been following you uh, here uh, in hermosillo sonora uh -huh. and uh, i would ask you about uh, probably some words that you have for us uh, as a community being that you um, managed to keep Discord and all those really great bands uh, moving on uh, in spite of uh, reality <laughs> and, and the way that we live. Let me say one thing about that. Some years ago, um, maybe 25 years ago, I was, a, there was a woman I knew who became a nun for an Orthodox faith. And it was a very intense, extreme Orthodox. And they had a, um, they lived in a little monastery uh, on a very small island in Alaska. Whoa. <laughs> on the top of a hill with no electricity, no running water. And I, s I had the opportunity to spend um, a couple weeks just up there with these monks and nuns. I was not a part of the faith. I'm not a subscriber to anything. She was just an, a friend who invited me to come check out their situation, which I did. And um, they worked all day farming and cleaning and taking care of the stuff and dealing with, you know, running a house. And there was probably 12, 15, 20 people there. Um, and then at night they would have dinner and then after dinner, you would have tea and a little something sweet. And then you could all, everyone would talk and it would just sort of be a conversation. And so we were all talking and I, there was a, the head superior, the mother superior, the leader of them. I said, what, you know, what do you say to people who don't, who think you're not really dealing with reality, right? Because they're living in this crazy world. And then she said, um, hold on. Sure. I'm gonna, so I asked her, what do you say to these people who say you're not dealing with reality? And she said, we deal with what goes into our bodies and we deal with what goes out of our bodies. 
how much more reality do you need? <laughs> so when you said like Discord, you're not really dealing with reality. Maybe we are actually dealing, we are the reality because we make records, right? We make music, we make records, we sell the records, we pay the bands, people have jobs, like we take care of each other. Why is that not reality? That's reality. So I do think that, um, you know, one thing I've thought a lot about, and you maybe you can remember the Fugazi song where I talk about, um, I think it's closed caption, but I say maybe move the source of light. Um, it's, it's this idea of getting a different perspective on things. And people often will look at something and say, well, that's what it is. But not if you change the light, because sometimes you change the light, you'll see, oh, it's something else too. Um, it's hard for me. I mean, obviously, I you know I can always speak in general generalities, um, in terms of whatever like your what's going on down there. But what I can say is that um, it was clear to me from the beginning that life would be much more interesting to do something that I loved. Um, despite what other people think about whether it's successful. Like, sure, I'm successful, but there are plenty of people who were in bands that I would argue, I mean, I'm not going to, I mean, I would say that those bands were not nearly as good as Fugazi, for instance, who were signed to major labels and sold 10 times as many records, and they have five houses and whatever, you know, um, you know, they're, they all live in, you know, they have pools and whatever. I don't live like that. Uh, so it could be argued that, um, I guess the point being is that it's not exactly a vow of poverty. I'm not poor, but I'm not nearly as wealthy as some other people. <laughs> and, um, but I'm engaged. I'm still doing it. Like today, you know, I actually, you know, I had, they, over the weekend, my, I have a 12 year old son and we assembled records to sell. That's what we did. Like we sat and inserted records into sleeves and put the sleeves into plastic bags and put the download. Like, and people were like, why would you do that? Because it's, we're doing something. I, that, we, it's, yes, it's interesting. Like it's really interesting. And, um, but I'm interested in life. So that's, that's just me. Um, and I want to say something about Minor Threat, too, because when you told me that it really resonated with you, um, when Minor Threat were playing, uh, I mean, I wrote the lyrics. I wrote all the songs except for Seeing Red. Jeff wrote Seeing Red, um, <clears throat> all the originals. And um, you'll note that I never say Ronald Reagan. Like, I never put anything in those lyrics that would tie them to a specific time. Because what I felt like Meyer Threat was, like I was a kid and I was singing about being a kid. And I was thinking, this is a, a universal thing to be a kid trying to figure out how the world works, how my body works, like how everything is connected. That is something that we all go through. And I, it was really important to me like, I didn't want to ever make it, like, you know, talking about, like, go, oh, oh, this happened in Washington, D.C., and there's, you know, whoever, you know, James Watt, the interior minister, you know, whatever, that kind of, you know, <laughs> it would have, it would just mean, it would, it would make it, it would put a layer of separation in between um, the lyrics and the music from the people who would be listening to it down the road. Um, and when Meyer Threat stopped playing, when we broke up, I mean, really a central consideration for me was that I didn't want to do anything that would compromise what I thought was a pure thing. Let's not continue to play these songs. Let's not do different music using the same name. Let's put it to bed and let it be what it is forever. You know, like that's it. That's, there's nothing, like the, the, my threat, and I feel like that, when I hear from people um, who are, and I, and there's actually, you know, a 13 year old has recently told me how much they like Meyer Threat. It really makes me happy. I mean, they could literally be my grandchild. 
<laughs> I'm not 58 years old, right? So it would be in, it's within the realms of possibility. And um, it makes me so happy to think that um, music that I thought was a, the, a pure um, expression of a kid burst would yeah. still resonate with kids. And I think, good, that's, that was the idea. Music kicked my ass. And I only <laughs> tend to return the favor. There you go. Excellent. I mean, uh, uh, Ian Mackay, did I pronounce that right? That's correct. Yeah. Ian Mackay. Uh, yeah. Corey Key, right now, great band, uh, okay. along with uh, Amy Farina and Joe Lally. Yeah. And, uh, well, we definitely enjoy that album and uh, we'll be playing it for for people here to Excellent. to get a chance to to listen to you uh, even more and um, and well on behalf of our uh, radio politica y rock and roll radio 106.7 fm uh, i don't know if you want to say hi to the people over here i would say hello to the people and i will say that it is one of my true an honest regret that I have never been to Mexico, ever. Really? And never. And the only time, Fugazi, there was one time we were invited to play, but it was in um, um, uh, um, Tijuana. I, I was thinking about that. Yes, definitely. And I, I bet it was the Iguana. Iguana. About yeah, five. and I, I, you know, I'm the one who booked the band. And I really studied the situation. And first off, it wasn't all ages. Mm. Um, although they said it doesn't really matter because anything goes. But that's not enough for me. Like, I want it to be, for me, like it's not enough to be like, oh, it's okay. Well, little slide. I want it to be stated publicly. This is an all ages event. So that was number one. But the other thing about it was that it felt like there's some component where it said, yeah, all these San Diego punks we go to the shows in San Diego, in Tijuana, and I said I'm not interested in playing to an like an American playground. There you, you know, go. It didn't feel right to me. I want to play in Mexico. So, <laughs> but it just never. And it's funny after Fugazi stopped playing, maybe um, two years after that, I started getting communication from these kids in Mexico City who seemed really together. Uh, and then since then. Guy's been down there. He's been he's done a performance center. Joe's been down there. Brennan's been down there. But I've never been. Um, <laughs> and I would love someday to come play, which is crazy that I've never been to Mexico. I've been all over the fucking world. Yeah, I've been so close, right? Yeah, but it, but but I think it's mostly because um, I, I, just haven't found the, I haven't found the the it's it's like a. I, yeah, I'm, I, it's the right, it's like the right connection. And so hopefully, I mean, right now, Kiriki is, we're a little limited since we have a 12-year-old son um, mm -hmm. and he's in school. Um, but the idea would be that we would um, come and figure out ways to do things really interesting. Like I would love to come to Sonora. I would love to, you know, like I've, I don't, you know, that's it. That's what I'm talking about is going in, you know, but I would just need to work with people who actually, have a real grasp on how things work, but also okay. have a grasp on um, staying away from like shady bullshit. I don't really want to get involved with like, I'm not, you know, it's not, it's not about the rock business. I just want to work with the people who are like kind of progressive minded and who are, you know, kind of interested in like a more a radical approach. That's, you know, that's sort of the, the way I would like to do it. And I think, uh, but we'll see. We got to wait. We got to let the thing pass first, right? Yeah, I guess. But if the, it, coast, it the coast is clear, then we start thinking about how we're going to move. But um, someday, but I'm really, I'm happy to make uh, your acquaintance. Um, and um, and I'm also down the road, if you, you know, if there's something you, you feel like, oh, yeah, let's have another chat with Ian. I'm happy to, can, you know, have another chat um, with you. So you know how to yes. find me. Definitely, definitely on uh, on my book. <laughs> and uh, well, uh, appreciate big time, uh, Ian, uh, this chat that we just had. A very, very interesting 
very funny stories. <laughs> and uh, I have we'll, a lot of the funny stories. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, well, uh, I'm looking forward to hear them all. And uh, if you ever decide to to have a chance and and uh, visit our desert here, because yeah, it's really hot, you'll have to bring tons of uh, sunscreen. <laughs> well, you you'll be more than welcome. Uh, Brilliant. So cool. Uh, until yeah. the next time. That's right. All right. So, thank you very much, Ian, and uh, have a great day. Say hi to all the members and Koriki and, and, well, the whole tribe, right? I'll tell the whole gang you said hey. Yeah, yeah, do that. Do that. All we right. really, really love you guys uh, over thank here. Thank you, Kyler. All right, brother. Again, Bye. see you.